how do you measure the biodiversity of all life on Earth? Naturalists have been working for centuries, exploring remote habitats on land and in water to catalog the planet's living organisms. Museums maintain huge collections of these specimens, which represent Earth's known biodiversity. But now, new technologies allow scientists to take a snapshot of life in a way that was not possible before. Today, we'll meet with marine biologist Chris Meyer to learn about his cutting-edge work on measuring biodiversity. Hi, thanks for joining us. I'm Maggie Benson, host of Live from Curious, Smithsonian Science How. We have an awesome show today for you, but before we get started, I want to ask you a question. You can respond using the poll that appears to the right of your video screen. Do you think it's important to know about every species on Earth? Yes? No? Or maybe you're not sure. Take a moment to think about it and put your answer in the window to the right. All right, while your results are coming in, we're gonna go to our expert. Today we have with us marine biologist Chris Meyer from the Smithsonian's National Museum of Natural History. Thanks for joining us, Chris. Thanks for having me, Maggie. So Chris, I know that you're, you study marine invertebrates. Can you tell us a little bit about what that is and what you do? Sure, uh, I study marine invertebrates which compose the bulk of the diversity of life in the ocean. Um, I'm basically a, a biodiversity scientist. Uh, our job is to go out and document the diversity of life on the planet. Like, much like many uh, researchers here at the Natural History Museum, uh, we go out and collect and try to discover uh, the new species and also document um, the patterns of life on the planet. Uh, in front of me is a variety of cowries that I've collected for my PhD, and we also have a number of specimens that we've brought back from a recent field trip. Uh, basically, I, biodiversity, in a nutshell, seems like a, maybe a complicated word people aren't familiar with, but it, it just means variation in life. And, and I see studying biodiversity is, is like uh, doing a giant jigsaw puzzle, and these, we're identifying the pieces. We don't have the box top, and so we're out there looking and exploring and finding the missing pieces, and more importantly than how they all fit together. So that's, uh, and we happen to do it on reefs where it's one of the most diverse spots on the planet. And you said you look at invertebrates, so those are animals without a backbone. That's correct. So 80% of our viewers think that it is important to study and understand every species on Earth. What do you think? That's, that's good news. <laughs> it's, it's, it, that, that's, I agree. So, it, it, and it, it's a lot of fun too. Wonderful. So you said that you go out and you actually look for these species, these pieces of the puzzle for your research. What do you do with those? Well, th what we do is it's, it's important to, to understand the animals uh, in their, in their, where they live. So it's very important to document the habitats that they're found in, uh, to, to take photographs of, of them living, because oftentimes when we preserve them as reference materials for later, they lose their color if they're in preservatives. So. We collect and relax and preserve the whole curation process of bringing them back to the museum so they can provide comparative material for scientists to look at for centuries to come. Uh, this is Natural History Museums maintain these collections uh, in order to provide that, that, um, the standards that other life is compared against. So how big is the collection, say, here at Smithsonian's Natural History Museum? Well, the Natural History Museum is one of the biggest ones in the world. Uh, we have, at le in the Department of Invertebrate Zoology, we have over 35 million specimens. Wow. Which, uh, actually, if you lined them up, it would extend for about 15 miles of shelf space. That's huge. It, it, it is so quite remarkable. why should we keep all of them? Well, I, I, the, it's, again, this is the, the, um, the main comparative material. When you think you find a new species, you come and compare it. It documents life. But more importantly, museums more and more are seeing themselves as um, uh, time capsules. You know, we can't go back in time, we don't have time machines, but the collections that we have made uh, enable us to go back and look at, at communities and species and ranges uh, so we can compare the present with the past to predict the future. So I understand that these are some of the collections that we actually have here at the museum? That's right. And what are they? So again, the, these are um, cowries. Uh, they're, they're snails that have a shell and they're, they're spectacular and I was very lucky to, to work on my PhD to, to go out and uh, collect and document them. And uh, this other collection is from uh, a series of, of work we've been doing to try and uh, use some of these new technologies to address diversity. What kind of new technologies do you mean? So 
in, it's a, been a relatively recent development. In the past, people would compare the, the bumps and the patterns uh, on these shells or maybe some other features of the shape. Now we have uh, new genetic technologies that allow us to get into the DNA, actually. And the DNA, as the blueprint of life, allows us to compare the sequences of Gs, As, Ts, and Cs from one species to another in order to get kind of a, a license plate or a, a barcode for every species. So every single species has its own unique DNA, like right. what we're looking yeah, at so now. So on the screen, if you look, if you notice, that's a, a, a little string of, of DNA that, that we've isolated from three different species. In the top, there are two butterfly fish species. And in the bottom, there's a hawkfish. And if you notice, there are more similarities between the butterfly fish species than there are between either of those butterfly fish and the hawkfish. So there's about three, there are about six differences between those butterfly fish species, whereas there's about 18 differences between any of the two butterfly fish and the hawkfish. And, and those, that little region of the DNA is what allows us to differentiate them at all life stages, not just as adults, but from eggs all the way up through even um, uh, when they die. So Mary, Oma, Mary from Omaha has a great question, and she wants to know, how much tissue do you need to get from a, for a DNA sample? It's a good question, Mary. Uh, you know, we don't need very much. The cells have a lot of DNA packed in there, super coiled. So we take just a tiny little fraction, and we also try, you know, if we can do it in a non-destructive way, we'll try and do that. When I was collecting these calories, you could just take a little piece of the foot, and actually, as long as you photo document and record what that was, you could let the animal go. It's a very small amount. Wonderful. So um, I know that you're employing these DNA techniques in some of your other projects, specifically in Marea. Can you tell us where Marea is sure. and why you chose that location for some of your field work? Yeah, so we took on this ambitious goal, just like we're trying to document life on the planet, to go to French Polynesia. And there's a little island called Marea that sits next to Tahiti. It's kind of right below Hawaii on kind of a mirror image across the equator. And we picked this island because there's ongoing research activity. There are two long-term uh, research stations that are conducting work. And we wanted to build a better uh, guidebook of all the diversity on this island. And because it's a tropical place, uh, it has all the features of these diverse communities. But at the same time, it's very remote. As you noticed, it's in the middle of the Pacific Ocean. So it had a manageable, what we thought was a manageable amount of diversity from plants and animals to fungi. So going back to the poll question that we actually asked our students, you are trying to count every single species that lives in Marea on land and in water. That was the, that was the goal we set ourselves with. So it was, it was a, a big effort and uh, we tasked ourselves for over five years to go out and try to collect every, a representative individual so we could get, because it was important to have a voucher that had tissue and DNA for every species that we encountered. How did you do that? So, well, it was just, it was just like a, a huge regional scavenger hunt. We invited experts from all over the world to come down, and they partook in expeditions uh, where we'd go from the tallest peaks. We dropped people out via helicopters on the highest mountains. We did light traps. We did black lighting. We did flight intercept traps. We did any way that, to collect and document diversity that we could, and we let the experts try and find that as best they could. It was, sometimes it would last one person for a year, other times it would be many people for up to, say, three weeks. Sounds so it was, it was a giant bio blitz, basically. That sounds incredibly labor intensive. What happened? What were some of the results of that project? It, it, uh, over five years, we, we kind of, as current count, we've, we've captured or we've documented over 7,000 species. Uh, as we thought, more than half of them are in the ocean between the fishes and the marine invertebrates. And here's a little um, reel of a handful of, of creatures in their portfolio that we captured. And you can see we captured video or uh, photographic images that tried to convey the, the diversity that we got. So you, if you saw them again, you'd notice them. And again, it was about 7,000, but we, we know we didn't finish. I mean, there's still many, many species to, to be discovered. And one thing, and if you look at the, the species that are rolling by, there are about um, maybe 80 species that are in that video montage right there. And if you wanted to, uh, look at all 7,000, you would have to, it would take about 45 minutes for us to run through, which would probably be by the time we're done. So, wow. So, and it's fun to think about at that rate, if you looked at all the described species on the planet, how long do you think it, it might take you to, to do that? So if it took 45 minutes to catalog 7,000 species, or not to catalog, but to show 7,000 species at that rate, and I know that there are over one million described species right. on Earth, I'm going to have to say several days. Yep. So there's, we think there's about 
million species described, and that's just the described stuff. And it would take you six continuous days of watching that, that movie clicking at that rate to see them all. Wow, that's a long time. Yeah, if, you, if you don't sleep or, or eat. <laughs> we don't so, need to do that. No. So we have another student question. Yep. Lillian wants to know, have you ever personally discovered a new invertebrate species? Uh, yes, actually. Uh, a couple, uh, when I was doing the work on the cowries, um, I, I stumbled across a number of things. There's a, um, this, there's a, a species here in the drawer. Uh, this is a, a map cowrie, and it was thought to be just one species, this one here. And it turns out that there are about six different species in that group, and it was through using these genetic sequences that we could compare and then go back in and look for more clues in the shell. And we found many, many other ones that are very similar to that. So we're in a, we're in a time phase now when we're, we're finding that there's probably much more diversity than we even thought, even in described species. So you keep saying described species and having these vouchers, meaning having the original species to be able to go back and reference with the images. Right. Why is it important to build this database, this registry? So one, one of the ways, once you can think of it as we've done kind of a door-to-door -door census of, of the ecosystem. So we've gone and looked at where taxa uh, species live. And now we can use that information to go and ask some interesting questions about, uh, get, once we've done the puzzles, we can figure out how they fit together. And some of our assumptions about how ecosystems work and how species interact, we're checking. And one of the ways we do that is by analyzing gut contents because as there's still DNA in the pieces that are getting eaten. And we've analyzed, uh, we had one study, I worked with, with a, a student, Matt Lorray, who's still here at the Smithsonian, looking at the guts of two hawkfish species. And the ecologist might so that's think- that's looking at what they were eating. Exactly, so we, we use this registry of the database and we examined their food items and we discovered that between the two fish species, um, there's a, a archive hawkfish and a flame hawkfish and they both live in the same coral head. Here's two pic pictures of each of those species. They live in the same neighborhood. We can think of them, they're at the same restaurant and some of the people would assume that they're eating the same thing because they're closely related. They might have similar tastes. Well, it turned out when we did the analysis that they ate completely different uh, prey items. The, the, Archai on the right ate bigger organisms and the flame hawk fish ate smaller ones. And so we think about how ecosystems function, there's less redundancy in the system. So it's, it, there's more diversity in it and or it, there's more inter tightly linked interconnections. So it's important to, to check our assumptions about that because maybe they're a little more fragile than we thought. So you can learn a little bit more about how everything's connected on this Absolutely. coral reef. Yep. So you've done a lot of work on registries. How, um, how does some of this sampling actually translate to some of your other work? So now that we've done the inventory, we can start thinking about doing observatory. So we ran around and collected things, ran, some, not randomly, but systematically around the island. But now we want to use this tool to monitor the system. So we've developed uh, a couple ways of standardizing that effect. And here's a little video of these autonomous reef monitoring structures, which are basically prefab housing we put down on the reef. Now, most of the reef diversity lives in the nooks and crannies of the reef and it's hard to access. So we build these structures to mimic that complexity. And we leave them in the ocean for a year. And we come back after a year, we put a lid on them and bring the entire neighborhood up and we analyze every living creature that we find in that, in that, um, in that stacked set of plates in the arm structure. And here you can see some of the images. We photo document each of the plates and they're beautiful. So all those creatures have grown on that plate in one year and we get a better handle on the diversity. And because it's standardized, we can compare place to place, site to site, and it can be done both regionally and globally. It's hard so. to believe that those are animals. It looks like artwork. It's, yeah, they look like spectacular paintings, don't they? And we brought, uh, just so people can this see right this, here. This, is, uh, this is one of the crates that we put on top of the that when we capture it, it's got a mesh, and so it keeps the creatures in it. And just to get a sense of, of the structure and the complexity that we use, uh, we have half of them have little caves and half of them are open. So that's the structure we take apart and analyze. And we look and see how many we got in our inventory compared to now using this device. So that's really interesting. So after you've actually picked apart in this huge study in Morea, every little animal that you're finding, in this one, you're saying that there could be species that you're oh, discovering that are undescribed. On every arm, we find a handful of more species in, in every instance, there's no doubt. So I think we have another poll here for you. We actually want to ask you how many species you think are undescribed. 
And this is again thinking about the idea that we don't know everything about life on Earth. So, what percentage of all biodiversity on the planet is still uncatalogued? 20%, 40%, 60%, or 80%? Take a moment to think about it and put your answer in the window to the right of your video screen. So Chris, we got some interesting results here. We have 86% of our viewers thinking that 80% of life on the planet is uncatalogued. What do you think? I, I think they're, that's a good answer. That's, <laughs> they, that, that's, that's about where we stand. And it's, uh, that, that's, it, it, there's a lot of work to do. Um, we think that there are about 80%, maybe 70% is still uncatalogued. And uh, so that means there are a lot of unknown species out there. And we now, we're getting a handle on how well we did in Morea by using devices such as this uh, arm structure. And um, through now even new technologies, we can start asking exactly how many things we're missing out there in the environment. So we have another student question for you. Mm -hmm. And um, this one is, do you collect species that are considered endangered? Uh, you know, we, we try to avoid uh, collecting protected or endangered species. Uh, very conscientious of, of there are lots of rules and regulations that we have to abide by. It's also important though to study them to know. So if they are studied, there are, there are various protocols in place such that it's done in a non-destructive, non-invasive non -invasive way. So I want to get back to this arm structure. Yeah. I want to know how you actually understand that there are undescribed right. and uncatalogued animals that live in this. So once we've done the voucher approach again, we, we turn the tables and we do a different technique. We look at the place, try to pick out all the species that we can actually see, but then we, then we actually take the creatures that lived on the arms and we scrape them off the plates and we put them in a blender. So we've shifted now from a, a find and grind approach to a, a grind and find. So we're make, we're literally make a reef smoothie out of them. Oh, that doesn't look very appetizing. <laughs> yeah, it doesn't smell very good either. And then we, we so you've got all, the entire community blended together and then we can extract the DNA in total of that entire community. And then we can run some kind of fancy analyses of looking at that license plate. And effectively, these are basically kind of toll booths or fast passes, so we can set them up to monitor the entire diversity. And here's a, there was a picture there of the, an actual, where you can actually see the DNA. And then we sequence that, and we get a library of all the members of the community. And then we can compare that library to what we have in our database. And if we're missing it, they're kind of dark taxa or dark species. You can think of it as dark matter in the universe. We know it's there, but we're really not sure what it's doing. And it's important to kind of understand how those, those trajectories, as, we, as, as there's change going on, we, we need to better understand the trajectories of all the, the communities. Is it falling off drastically? Is it falling off a cliff or does it fall off kind of steadily? So I don't understand why it's important to understand all of this. Why is biodiversity important and why is it under important That's to good. understand all of these undescribed species? It's a really good question and I hope to do an, a little analogy here. Uh, I don't know how many of the students out there have ever played the game Uno. I think most kids have probably run across this game. It's a pretty simple card game where uh, it's like crazy eights. And I want to ask a poll of the students to see if they understand and try and learn a little bit why biodiversity is important. Great, so let's go to the poll. So which UNO hand do you prefer to be dealt with? Hand one or hand two? Hand one has mostly red cards, while hand two has more variety of colors and numbers. The answers are in and our viewers are unanimous in saying that the second hand, the one with more variety, is better. What do you think? That's exactly the message. You know, again, the diversity, that variation, is a hedge against change. So, I mean, it's fine if it stayed on red, but if it shifts, you better have something in your back pocket to, to adapt to that. So, in many ways, that's about that's biodiversity, whether it's in populations or in communities or whatever, you need to have the capacity to adapt to change, and it provides you some resilience against that. So, it's important to document how much of that diversity is in the community to understand its, its capacity to adapt. So you've pioneered this work in Marea. Where else have you applied it? So we've 
we've taken what we've learned and the lessons from Morea, and now we're actually going to the heart of marine diversity in Indonesia. This is kind of the heart of the Coral Triangle, where it's the most diverse marine spot on the planet. And we've partnered, we've set up an Indonesian Biodiversity Research Center at Udayana University in Bali, where we've been training. Uh, every summer we run courses on biodiversity inventories and survey methods. And we're training the next generation of Indonesian scientists uh, to learn more about their biodiversity to become better stewards and better managers of their natural heritage. So that's really training the next generation of scientists. Do you work with other students? We also have thought long and hard about how to engage uh, all levels of students in the process and uh, we've worked a lot with um, middle school students and high school students and we've adopted a, another method this one cubic foot and I've, I'm going to bring out this wire this frame here it's a very simple model that we've developed and we're prototyping this process to go around and capture a cubic foot of biodiversity in any habitat and so we've worked with students out in the uh, Golden Gate uh, National Recreation Area and here you can see some students piloting this project where we were in a looking in a pond area and we challenged those students to find the most diverse areas and then observe the habitat and document all the species because again that's a by focusing our attention on one cubic foot that itself is a functioning ecosystem it becomes a bit of a biological barometer of diversity so you can go back and monitor the same area time over time or look at impacts along gradients maybe away from a path or uh, away from a road or something like that and it's really fun. The students have a great time. And they provide real data that then can be comparable from site to site or class to class. So, so it's really another version of the arms. It is. It's, it's exactly a version of the arms. It's life in a cubic foot. Yeah. So we have another question mm -hmm. from Mrs. Hamilton. Okay. And her class wants to know, what's the most diverse ecosystem in the world? Wow, that's a, that's a great question. Uh, it depends on the scale that you sample it at, right? So that's, that's the trick. If we were taking one cubic foot, and putting that anywhere, where would, where would we find that on the planet? Well, uh, David Litschwager that I've worked with, he did this in tropical rainforests and tropical reefs, and tropical reefs had about 330 species in it, whereas a tropical rainforest canopy only had about 130. Now that's just in a cubic foot, but if you aggregate it over, I think the, the tropical rainforest might win over the reefs, although it's debatable. That's what we're out there testing. So, so Robin has a question, yep. and she wants to know how you became a marine biologist. <laughs> Good question, Robin. Uh, you know, I grew up um, being fascinated with diversity, visiting a lot of museums, doing a lot of reading, um, and I basically just kept that curiosity going and, and realized I had some great teachers and mentors, and they were really important and kept, kept encouraging me to keep pursuing that passion. And I think that's, that's what I would suggest to any students out there, just you know, follow, your, follow your heart and your passion, and, and if you're interested in it, and it takes work, you know, there's no doubt, but I was really curious, so makes it makes it easy. All right, so this one comes from Mrs. Stewart's fourth grade class. How do you name the new species that you find? That's a good question. It, it, it's uh, oftentimes the name conveys something about the features of the animal that make it distinct, or oftentimes it's named after somebody who they want to um, give some sort of credit. You know, it could be uh, uh, your wife or your benefactor or whatever, or the place. Oftentimes it's, it's the name conveys where it was found first. So this one comes from Finn. And Finn wants to know, how do you memorize all the names of the marine invertebrates? I don't. <laughs> <laughs> that would be really hard. It takes years to, to I mean, I, and I don't like memorization. That's what I didn't like biology at, at first. But, but actually then understanding it as a system makes it a lot easier. And it's just, it's like any language. The more you do it, uh, the more familiar it becomes, so. So from Umberto, what is the most amazing thing you've ever seen in the ocean? Most, everything's amazing, so. No, I, I agree. That, that's a great question, <laughs> but you know, I, it, is, it is fascinating. Every species tells a story, and, and uh, to, to some, of the more some of the more interesting interactions, there are, are really amazing uh, gall crabs that actually live in the corals, and they get the corals just like a hornbill might, to, to kind of grow around uh, the female, and then the male goes in and out and feeds the female. It's, it's an amazing interaction, and um, that's kind of a wild um, species. And there, there are many, many stories like that across uh, marine ecosystems. So, Elio from Louisville, how can our class study biodiversity like you? Uh, well, that's one thing we're trying to do with the BioCube project is we're trying to bring it to everybody's backyard. So, um, you know, one of the ways is just to sit down and, and appreciate and observe just 
try to try to find the most diverse spot in in your local uh, playground or your local communities, and um, and. Again, we're trying to prototype this and get this out to everybody. So I think uh, in, in about a year's time, we'll be able to help you out a lot. And you'll be able to feed into a, a national effort to document diversity in your neighborhoods. Sophie wants to know, what's the most um, interesting thing you've discovered? Huh, Sophie. Uh, the most, you know, it, it's great. I have a great job because uh, everything is interesting. You keep moving on from one thing to another. I mean, that's, but I think... Some of the most interesting things was when I was first starting to use these DNA te techniques as a tool and realizing what it revealed as far as the diversity, particularly in these cowries, where people had studied them for centuries and, and could never really verify some of their ideas. And then to bring the power of the DNA to look and, and document that there was all this underlying diversity uh, was, I, I remember specifically the day where I got the data back and I was like, wow. There's, this isn't one species, this is really five species. That was, that was pretty remarkable. This one comes from Judy from Santa Fe. She wants to know, what kinds of things kill biodiversity? Uh, that's a good question, Judy. Um, you know, as far as threats to diversity, the two biggest threats to reefs these days, local threats, are certainly overfishing and, and bad water quality. And uh, those, those really threaten diversity because it changes the dynamics of the ecosystem. The fish are there to help graze down the algae and the corals are competing with them and you can create a complete tipping point but we're actually looking at what are the that's fish algae corals but if you look at the underlying diversity what's it doing to that we really don't have a good handle on everything else that's in the reef so um, but definitely the big threats are, are fishing and, and water quality so Zach from Little Rock wants to know how their class can get bio cubes to use and I say we say stay tuned right yeah, I mean, again, we're, we're really close. We're working on all the tools to capture the data. And, uh, and again, stay tuned, Curious. We'll be using Curious, and we're working with some other developers, iNaturalist, uh, as a platform to help, uh, again, democratize and really put this in everybody's hand. So what is the favorite part about your job? Ask Sophie. I'm always excited to go to work. <laughs> so, <laughs> that's a good thing. You know, I, you know, every day you're going to see something new or you'll come across something that surprises you. And uh, you get to, you get to um, follow your passions. It's a great place to be in. It's a great uh, line of work. And I just feel lucky every day to, to be able, I'm, I feel like a, I've never grown up. I'm still, I'm still a kid at heart. So thank you so much for tuning in today. Um, and thank you, Chris, for being here. Is there anywhere that our viewers can go to learn a little bit more about your work? Sure. Uh, if you're interested in following up on any of this, you can. there are two websites that I could steer you to. Um, uh, MariaBioCode.org uh, gives you information about the Maria Bioco project, and also the IBRC.org tells you a little about, about what we're doing in Indonesia. And of course, also pay attention to the Curious website where we'll be posting more information and follow up with uh, as the BioCube project matures. So thanks. Great. Thank you, Chris. Mm -hmm. Thanks again for tuning in today. If you missed part of this broadcast or want to see it again, it'll be archived later today on curious.si.edu. Thanks so much for joining and see you next time on Smithsonian Science How.